Hello, I'm Blake Wilder. I'd like to start by thanking Chris Gonzalez for putting this panel together and for giving me the opportunity to share my work. Unfortunately, I have to attend a family wedding so I can't be physically present. I apologize to my fellow panelists and to all of you, but I hope that this video presentation might be an adequate substitute. I'm also gonna make sure I'm online during our panel time and you can tweet to me at Blake is Wilder and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. The title of my presentation is The Harlem Health Lighters, Black Soldiers, and Visual Representations of Heroism. I'll begin with a little bit of background about my ongoing research on black soldiers during the First World War, but I'll spend most of my time looking at three scenes from Max Brooks' 2014 graphic novel, The Harlem Hellfighters. The Harlem Hellfighters was the nickname given to the 369th Infantry Regiment during the First World War including the 369th Infantry. A total of 370,000 black men served in the U.S. Army during the war. But not surprising given the state of Jim Crow America, the role that black soldiers played was complicated and politicized. Some black soldiers were never even given uniforms because they were always destined for labor battalions, working as stevedores, loading and unloading ships. Other regiments of black soldiers that did receive uniforms and actual combat training were never given the chance to fight. Once they got to France, they were forced to perform manual labor like digging trenches or reburying the dead. The Harlem Hellfighters, though, did see frontline action. In fact, they actually saw more combat than any other American regiment. But the factors that contributed to that distinction are a bit dubious. The 369th was rushed to France earlier than planned because of racial animosity in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where they were stationed for training. And once they got to France, they were contracted out to the French army because white Americans didn't want to serve alongside African American troops, despite the racial discrimination that state shaped U.S. Army policies and administration. Black soldiers played an important role in the war efforts. If you're interested in learning more about black soldiers during the World War I era, I would highly recommend Chad Williams' Torchbearers of Democracy, which does important work to recover the positive effects of black military service as an alternative to existing historical narratives, which emphasize discrimination within the army and the racial violence that followed the war. Parallel to Williams' work, my research seeks to highlight the positive effect that black soldiers had on the way that African Americans imagined themselves as part of the nation. I'm currently working on my dissertation, Black Men in No Man's Land, which presents my analyses of a recurring scene of white and black Americans meeting each other as soldiers in no man's land. A recurring scene that I refer to as the trope of two Americans. I take this name from a particularly salient example, Florence Lewis Bentley's short story, Two Americans, which was published in The Crisis in September and October of 1921. Based on Bentley's short story as the prime example, I chart seven textual features that repeat in the different versions of this battlefield scene. The trope of two Americans, as I define it, appears in a range of texts created by both black and white authors. The earliest version appears in 1918 in a lost D.W. Griffith film called The Greatest Thing in Life. I argue that the scene of a black soldier dying in the arms of a white soldier whose life he had just saved provided a potent image that was taken up by black authors to represent black heroism. Three of the other primary texts that include the trope of the two Americans, On the Fields of France, Every Man's Land, and Going Home, are all plays. I'd also like to point out that one of the recurring features of the trope of two Americans is the culminating tableau vivant that portrays the black and white soldiers dying arm in arm as brothers. This vivid visual description appears in the prose fictions as well as the stage directions of the plays. I call attention to the film, the plays, and the feature of the tableau vivant because I think that the significance of black military service during the First World War is particularly rooted in the visibility of black soldiers as symbols of heroism. Significantly, both halves of Bentley's short story were accompanied by drawings that presented the heroism of black soldiers visually. The first image depicts the wounded black soldier carrying the unconscious white soldier to safety. 
the central act of the trope of two Americans. The second image shows the ghost of the black soldier's brother, who was previously lynched by the white soldier, telling the black soldier that returning to save the white soldier was the only way to triumph over the hate that had caused the war he's fighting in. The decision of the black soldier to save the white soldier in spite of, but not in ignorance of, the discrimination of Jim Crow is crucial to the illustration of the heroic sacrifice that black soldiers made for the ideal of democracy. Bentley's Two Americans was also presented graphically in 2011 as part of the Graphic Classics Anthology series. The adaptation of Two Americans by Alex Simmons and Trevor Von Eid not only repeats the core images that accompanied the original publication, but also presents a powerful graphic version of Bentley's story that gives visual emphasis to the story's conclusion that both the black and the white soldier are equally American. They are simply two Americans. My dissertation research is limited to texts written between 1914 and 1937 because I'm primarily interested in how the experience of the First World War influenced the representation of black soldiers and black masculinity more generally. But it should be no surprise that I read Max Brooks' 2014 graphic novel, The Harlem Hellfighters, as soon as I could get my hands on it. With The Harlem Hellfighters, Brooks was not just interested in presenting a compelling narrative. Rather, he wanted to recover a historically significant story that has been woefully overlooked. This is clear in the historical notes and bibliography presented at the end of the text, but it is also clear in the way that certain historical sources are embedded within the narrative. I want to look at three instances where historical sources from the World War I era are incorporated into the narrative of the Harlem Hellfighters. Each of these instances uses a similar presentational strategy that exploits the parallel visual and verbal tracks of the graphic narrative format. These narrative episodes segment the text of the historical source and prolong the duration of the reader's encounter with that text across an extended accompanying visualization. These three historical sources, a W.E.B. Du Bois speech, a Saturday Evening Post story by Irving Cobb, and scenes from Griffith's Birth of a Nation, all concern the significance of black soldiers and how they are represented. By exploiting the parallel verbal and visual tracks of the graphic narrative form to juxtapose historical sources and contemporary visualization, Brooks and Canaan White, who draws the illustrations for the Harlem Hellfighters, provoke the reader to reconsider how black heroism was imagined in the past and how we visualize it today. The first scene presents a W.E.B. Du Bois speech juxtaposed against images of everyday African Americans. This visual juxtaposition appears as an interlude as the Harlem Hellfighters are on their way to France and is bookended by depictions of black soldiers being seasick on board a ship. Although an image of a vomiting soldier is probably the last thing that would come to mind when we think of heroism. The intervening scenes of everyday of African Americans and Du Bois' stirring rhetoric serve to highlight that the very fact and existence of black soldiers was a symbol of heroism. To the everyday African Americans toiling to make a life in Jim Crow America, even the tedious and mundane trials that black soldiers had to endure, such as the long, uncomfortable journey to France, were heroic efforts. I call this first historical source a speech by Du Bois but it's more accurately an amalgamation or parody of Du Bois' wartime editorials. It incorporates some wording taken directly from the souls of black folk, along with the types of sentiments that appeared in Du Bois' editorials during the war. Interestingly, Du Bois is not actually named in the text. For all the other historically based characters that appear in the novel, Brooks and White use a square text box to present an editorial identification of who they are. But with Du Bois, they allow his very recognizable image and his famous words to serve as an identification. The visual track of the narrative moves from the France-bound ship to Du Bois' study, as the verbal track presents Du Bois' declaration that a burden fit for gods is borne on the shoulders of men. The emphasis on men highlights the importance of black soldiers as a visual contradiction to the typical emasculating discourses of Jim Crow.
As Du Bois recites his famous articulation of the two souls, the two warring ideals contained within the bodies of African Americans, the reader views his audience, a group of men and his study, standing in a military at ease position. As Du Bois's speech continues onto the next page, the visual track zooms out to show the everyday life of Harlem. Du Bois's words point to black soldiers as the proof that the dreams of African Americans can come to fruition as the reader glimpses a black fruit vendor and a black mother passing by on the street below. The narrative's verbal track draws out Du Bois's comments about living examples of courage and pride and the harvest of black faith and banners of hope over multiple panels as the reader encounters a visual juxtaposition with black bricklayers and delivery men, with black owned businesses and automobiles. Du Bois' speech concludes on a third page that presents a close up of Dave Scott, one of the novel's fictional protagonists in the very center of the page, revealing this interlude as a flashback, a possible explanation of Dave's motivation for joining and suffering through the trials on the boat. As Du Bois' speech concludes by specifying that the burden borne by black soldiers is the crushing epithet of hero, the visual track returns to the France-bound ship where Dave and the other Harlem Hellfighters are enduring the mundane hardships of serving in the army. The wording of the epithet of hero references a specific editorial from January 1919 titled A Vanishing Epithet which was a rebuttal to the Irving Cobb story that serves as the historical source in the second scene I want to look at. Cobb's story, Young Black Joe, appeared in the Saturday Evening Post in August 1918. The climax of Cobb's story is an account of the heroic efforts of Henry Johnson, who almost single-handedly fought off a German raiding party after his partner, Needham Roberts, was wounded. Johnson killed five Germans using a knife and his rifle as a club after it jammed and the amount of abandoned equipment suggested that the German raiding party may have been as large as 30 men. Johnson, who was shot twice during the raid, was almost immediately awarded the French Cross of War. He was not awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor until June 2015. Cobb knew that the general story of Johnson would already be well known to the American public through the much quicker coverage of daily newspapers. So he attempted to sensationalize the efforts of Johnson as dramatic evidence of the equality of black soldiers. Unfortunately, Cobb can't seem to see past his own ingrained racism, and his story is a contradictory mess of caricature and presumably genuine attempts to valorize black soldiers. If you include the inset action close-up frames, White's illustration of the fight between Johnson and the German raiding party comprises 25 panels and spans six pages. Except for a brief editorial introduction and occasional exclamations from the fighters, the only text on those six pages is a 134-word quote taken verbatim from Cobb's story. As with Du Bois's speech, the verbal track of, of Cobb's quote is segmented into tiny parcels as small as one or three or five words. This strategic decision forces the reader to prioritize either the verbal or the visual. Obviously, the reader can return to read the other track and then appreciate the juxtaposition of the two. But on a first pass, the segmentation of the text and the minute details of knife stabs and punches are too incremental to digest both sequentially. This allows and even prompts the reader to appreciate the visual heroics of Johnson's effort to take the time to imagine the action of fighting off a German raiding party as an alternative to the mediated account that most Americans got through Cobb's problematic story. The importance of having a visual alternative to Cobb's story is all the more apparent when considering the juxtaposition with the verbal track. The final claim of the Cobb quote, that hereafter, N-I-G-G-E-R, will be merely another way of spelling the word American, ends at the same point as the fight sequence with a full page panel of Johnson standing over the bodies of dead Germans as reinforcements arrive. Because of the decision to segment Cobb's words into short clipped phrases, Cobb's problematic claim is broken up so that the only text on the full page illustration of Johnson is the word American. Much like Bentley's story, Two Americans, the juxtaposition that Brooks and White provide for the reader of the Harlem Hellfighters suggests that the service and sacrifice of black soldiers 
entitles them to the full rights of American citizenship. To make the importance of the visual heroics of Johnson's fight even more apparent, Brooks and White juxtapose the culminating full-page illustration of Johnson with another full-page illustration that exists as an image within the story world, an image drawn by a white illustrator, presumably accompanying Cobb's story. The visual style is markedly different, and Johnson himself comments that it makes him look like a gorilla. Thanks in part to Cobb's story, Johnson's efforts in No Man's Land has become a narrative about the representation of black soldiers. In Harlem Hellfighters, Brooks and White shift the focus back to the actual fight itself. The contrasting styles of illustration is also telling. The bulging muscles and the hard line of White's illustration of Johnson and the other Harlem Hellfighters stands out from the loose cross-hatching in the intradiegetic White-drawn illustration. White's drawing style also stands out from the 1921 illustrations that accompany the publication of Bentley's Two Americans and from the drawing style used in the 2011 graphic adaptation of Bentley's story. The drawing style that White uses is highly reminiscent of Marvel's house style, a recognizable and largely consistent aesthetic that dominated Marvel comics until at least the mid-1990s. This style, which features action-packed fight scenes between highly muscular men, positioned the black soldiers of the Harlem Hellfighters not just as heroes, but as superheroes. They faced all the same battlefield horrors that white soldiers faced but they also had to face racial discrimination both within and beyond the army. I'd like to conclude by looking at a slightly different example. The third narrative episode uses images from the birth of a nation instead of words as a historical source, but it uses the same strategy of extended duration and juxtaposition to illustrate the importance both of black soldiers and also of how they are visualized and remembered. Mark, the narrator of the Harlem Hellfighters, has been imprisoned for fighting with white soldiers after they disrespected him and the cross of war that he was bearing. When Sergeant Mandala visits him in the jail cell to return his medal and bring him back to the front, Mark refuses to return to the Harlem Hellfighters to risk his life fighting in a white man's war. As Sergeant Mandala leaves Mark in his cell, he makes a last jab about the medal not fitting on Mark's old monkey suit. As Mark thinks back to the spring of 1915 when he worked as an usher during the birth of a nation, the reader encounters an image of laughing white faces that has appeared without context throughout the novel, most notably in the very beginning when Mark decides to enlist. Except for a small bit of narration, the next four pages have no verbal track. Instead, a double visual track juxtaposes a series of images. Mark and his jail cell in 1918 is set against Mark as an usher for Birth of a Nation in 1915. The laughing faces of white audience members are contrasted with the pained faces of black audience members in the balcony. And the thread that unites the past and the present, the white and the black spectators, is the birth of a nation and its depiction of a caricatured image of blackness as stupid and uncontrollably violent. The major scenes of birth of a nation are condensed onto a single page. At the bottom, Gus's famous chase of Flora is clearly recognizable, along with the KKK riding to the rescue. What is perhaps less recognizable is the film's depiction of black Union soldiers at the top of the page. The cap of the Union Army uniform identifies this panel as is seen early in the film when a group of disorderly black soldiers come to the town stealing chickens and harassing the white townsfolk. The black soldiers shown in Birth of a Nation are little different from the mob of criminals, which is exactly the famously racist image of blackness that we associate with Griffith's film. But during the First World War, a differently visualization of blackness emerged. It was rooted in the visibility of black soldiers, and ironically, it can be traced to a different Griffith film, although it was black authors who took up the image of black and white Americans on the battlefield and transformed it into something else. But why does the visualization of black soldiers and black heroism matter? The parallel visual tracks of this final scene make it clear. The scene of Mark in the jail cell and in the theater have little or no movement, but the perspective for both continually zooms out, creating a parallel between the bars of the prison and the grid lines of the theater. At the same time, the sequence shows a stark contrast between black and white, suggesting that Jim Crow insistence on racial difference will inevitably trap black Americans in disenfranchised positions.
That's why it's significant that the images and narratives of black soldiers coming out of First World War literature show black soldiers as simply and equally American. By including historical sources, exploiting the separate verbal and visual tracks of the graphic narrative form, and extending duration to create juxtapositions, Max Brooks and Kanan White prompt the reader of the Harlem Hellfighters to reimagine how we view black heroism. Thank you.